Thank you, everybody, for uh, braving whatever kind of traffic you had to face. Uh, as we'll see, that was probably an, that's probably an appropriate warm-up act for this uh, for this program. You know, the cities are are much more than, uh, as as we know, than uh, uh, concrete trees and all the other, all their other physical components. Uh, they're ideas, and once you consider them that way, um, it opens up uh, an, infinite, uh, an infinite range of alternatives. You know, we commonly think of uh, history as a mirror reflecting what happened and uh, made us what we are today. I kind of like to think of it as a disco ball, uh, a, with hundreds or an infinitude of mirrored facets, each one reflecting a, uh, a possible outcome. Between this Seattle and this Seattle, which is probably already out of date, the, uh, any, number of, uh, any number of trails could have been taken, any, uh, an uncountable number of decisions, accidents, some of them as remote as the failure of a bank in London, have altered the course of the city's fate in dramatic and, in some cases, uh, uh, permanent, and as we'll see, in some cases, only, uh, only temporary ways, because there are second acts for, uh, for cities in American life. This was perhaps the first grand project proposed in Seattle that never got built. And uh, appropriately, it was, uh, uh, it was proposed as the ashes were still cooling from the Great Fire in 1889. A, what would, would then have been considered a skyscraper opera house with uh, luxury apartments, stores uh, at 2nd Avenue and University Street by uh, by Lewis Sullivan, who came all the way out from Chicago to work on the project. The, the father, uh, he's often called, of the skyscraper. Uh, the town's, uh, the money and the politicians in the town were all, were all behind it, uh, but the financing failed because of the failure of that British bank, and it uh, faded forever, or so it seemed, until 109 years later, Benaroya Hall was built on the same location. The, but the most ambitious, the most ambitious, as you, as you may, may know, most ambitious uh, conception of a new Seattle was, uh, uh, was put together by a, uh, a, an engineer and kind of stalwart of the City Beautiful movement named Virgil Bogue. Uh, who was invited out here in 1910 to come up with a plan of Seattle and probably surpassed the expectations or the fears of everybody who uh, brought him out here. Uh, this is the most famous aspect of it. You can see at 4th and Blanchard, a grand civic center, city hall, Beaux-Arts style with a high tower, and then running, uh, running down to Lake Union, uh, a magnificent uh, tree-lined boulevard, or sort of a Champs-Élysées, uh, uh, one of a whole, of a whole ring of uh, radiating boulevards that would be superimposed on the city's rectangular grid, and at the other end, another grand tower, a, uh, a central rail station. We remember the location of this because it will, uh, it will come to be, though so Bogue's plan never got built, it, uh, it, in a sense, got a, got a second chance as well. You can see the Civic Center. Bogue loathed the skyscrapers that were then springing up in New York and Chicago. Uh, he looked toward Europe for inspiration and thought that Seattle should, uh, should have uh, palaces of culture and government, just as great European cities do. But he also proposed uh, a network of boulevards and arterial streets, uh, some of them and uh, scenic byways running all the way to Mount Rainier, a tunnel under Lake Washington, Mercer Island uh, set aside as a, uh, a park four times the size of Stanley Park, 
90 miles of rapid rail, 33 of them underground, and this was before the auto age had even really taken hold. Uh, it was pricey, and it was also terrifying to the, uh, to the downtown property owners and landlords who feared that uh, investment and tenants would move north and, live, uh, and leave them stranded to the south. It seems they also scared uh, people on Queen Anne uh, because there have been rumors of a, of a Queen Anne regrade. Uh, this is the only documentation I've been able to find and uh, I have no idea of the source. This was, this was posted on History Link. Uh, the author who found it is, uh, is deceased and if anybody knows uh, any more about where it came from, uh, I would love to find out. The Municipal League uh, and the uh, progressive thinking, good government uh, types uh, fought back, pitching the Bogue Plan. And, but in 1912, it failed at the, uh, it failed at the polls. But, uh, meanwhile, city engineer R.H. Thompson, as you know, was, uh, uh, was already undertaking uh, a series of regrades, transforming uh, transforming the, uh, the hills around downtown, eliminating the hills around downtown. And of course the Bogues uh, Civic Center would have run right along, right along this uh, territory here, but without it, we, we, got, uh, we got just uh, simple commercial development. The first mass transit plan in Seattle was actually proposed by Thompson in 1906. And, uh, uh, a year later, the company operating the streetcars put together a more, a more solid plan for a subway, which oddly enough included a tunnel running under 3rd Avenue and uh, running under Capitol Hill with, uh, with uh, elevators going to deep underground stations. 1918, uh, uh, 1918 the uh, Cedra Woolley uh, uh, dentist and uh, and his partner proposed a monorail system running right along Westlake Avenue. It never got uh, it never got far, but their uh, their uh, arguments for it were uncannily like the rise it above it all campaign of the later monorail plan, which were uh, an eight an eight year saga five times to the polls. Uh, eventually rejected that uh, proposed a, an elevated transit line running from Ballard to West Seattle, which, you know, people, uh, opponents attacked as unnecessary. Now, of course, we're on the way to building a light rail line from, uh, from Ballard to West Seattle. More transit plans rose and uh, uh, rose and fell over, in, over the next couple of decades, but by the time the troops came home, and the suburbs were spreading. Uh, mass transit was uh, uh, mass transit was a faded dream. Uh, instead, uh, highways were proposed, cutting, as you can see, across the southwest corner of the city, through West Seattle, and up uh, and up what was then called Empire Way, and across Portage Bay to Lake City and beyond. The Washington State Bridge Authority proposed uh, tunnels, two tubes to Bainbridge Island and a pair of bridges connecting Vashon to, uh, to Kitsap County and Seattle. Uh, the Seattle Times in the same magazine cheered the idea the PI uh, visualized it like this. And that I believe, by the way, was by, the, uh, by Bob McCausland who did all the, radio, the, uh, the Husky cartoons for all those decades for, for real old timers here. At the same time, uh, Washdot uh, was cooking up the, uh, the R.H. Thompson Expressway which would run from, from the south of the city along what's now MLK Way, and, and a tunnel, not a tube, under Union Bay. 
and of course actually started building it. Uh, the, uh, a popular backlash against it uh, eventually got it killed. The city was, uh, you know, the citizens got the city to oppose it and the famous uh, ex ramps to nowhere took to serving another purpose. But this was, uh, this was a time for thinking big. The uh, plan for downtown, uh, commissioned from uh, the Monson designers in New York, uh, included two ring roads around the city. One, a uh, connections between I-99 and I-5 so that you could bypass it just about every which way you wanted to, and then an inner ring road with huge garage parking garages at each corner of the city. Uh, one of those garages would have taken out uh, much of the Pioneer Square derelict district, as it was seen then, and the Pike Place Market. And the market would have been, uh, market area would have been replaced with high-rise uh, towers, apartment towers, uh, and, of course, a new, much more modern home for the market. Again, this was the, uh, this was the era of citizen activism. Folke Nyberg, Victor Steinbrecht, and, uh, and their friends and neighbors uh, rose up, fought the market, uh, got Warren G. Magnuson to come up with some money to save it, and uh, we never got to find out what a high-rise market would be like. As time went on, the proposals I got perhaps more creative or more outlandish, depending on how, you, on how you want to see them, and had less to do with building things up than with tearing things down or at least restoring some element of wild nature to the city, including the very heart of the city. Uh, this is how I-5 got built. I don't know if any of you remember George Hartman, an architect. Uh, uh, who passed away a few years ago. He was from Czechoslovakia, and he believed that every great city, like the great cities of Europe, had to have a river, had to be on a river, and that Seattle would be incomplete until it was. So he proposed a lid on I-5 and a river on top of the lid, the Riviera de Seattle. Uh, George was quite a fount of ideas. He also, when the, uh, when the waterfront uh, battle over whether to replace the viaduct, dig a tunnel, or send everyone on surface streets was raging, he proposed an offshore viaduct, uh, highway viaduct, cutting through Elliott Bay. Uh, far from the only person to think, of, uh, to, to think of some new uses to put the waterfront to. In, uh, in 1963, uh, when, uh, when uh, Seattle was debating what to do for its sports teams and how to get professional teams, uh, they, uh, a group of architects proposed a floating sport stadium in the bay. When, the, uh, when another battle was uh, uh, raging over where to relocate the uh, the Central Library, which eventually was rebuilt in the same location, uh, George proposed a floating library in the middle of the bay, which would, um, might be a very common place, I think, to sit and read a book and have a cup of coffee, but we'll never know. Around that same time, a city engineer named Emmett Wallman proposed a salmon stream running from Volunteer Park down to the bay with, uh, and running, over a, running through an elevated glass viaduct to entertain the, uh, the shoppers or park goers at Westlake Plaza. And of course, uh, whether they would be shop goers or uh, shoppers or uh, park goers was uh, the subject of another great debate uh, that's not so much remembered now as the, uh, as the Commons is, but was also uh, uh, dragged on for years and stirred up uh, very alternate visions of the city, uh, whether, to, whether to build a central park, a green central park that Seattle had always lacked, uh, at Westlake, or to, um, uh, to put in the 
sort of stores and, uh, that we have now. And the downtown, uh, downtown retail interests, the downtown association uh, were uh, was terrified of a park uh, for fear that it would be too attractive to the kind of people they didn't want, want around the stores. Uh, Charles Breyer won the, uh, uh, won the mayor's office in 1977 campaigning for the park over Paul Schell, who had been the city planning director uh, who, uh, who uh, uh, advocated uh, development there. But uh, then uh, even Royer wasn't able to get the park built, and we got a Rouse Mall instead with a very popular plaza. Speaking of wild and crazy ideas, uh, John Hinneberger of the Seattle Times uh, proposed rebuilding Denny Hill, degrading, I guess, deregrading <laughs> Denny Hill. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, an architect named Jerry Garcia, not that Jerry Garcia. <laughs> Liked the idea so much, he designed a partial regrade. It would have been a 60-foot tall hill at Denny Park, which would, you know, be, probably be just, uh, just the sort of escape we might like as the buildings go up tall around it. A few years later, Hinnerberger and, uh, and Fred Bassetti uh, came up, architect Fred Bassetti, came up with a, uh, a much grander idea, sort of echoing and uh, broadening uh, uh, Bogue's great central concourse, which was, of course, the Seattle Commons, a green park with play fields and woods and paths and lawns running from, uh, running from uh, Denny Park and Denny Way to, uh, to Lake Union. Paul Allen, uh, as, you, as you may recall, put up, uh, lent $25 million to the campaign. It went ahead, and bought, went ahead buying land, and uh, on condition, however, that the voters approve a package of a little over $100 million uh, to complete the project. And a, a populist uh, you know, uh, resistance arose over it, uh, it would decrying the uh, development that would come up because it would come with a, um, a significant rezone for the surrounding properties and uh, uh, new commercial and residential development uh, and you know calling for protecting the small businesses, the little uh, the little well, a lot more shops like the trophy shop that I, last I looked was still left there and uh, the um, low-rise, old-income housing, rooming houses and things that, uh, uh, that still stood there. Uh, and so the commons failed a couple times at the polls and uh, Allen got the land back and of course, as you know, acquired a lot more land. Vulcan Development has, has built a new city to the north of the city that uh, that the opponents of the Vogue plan feared would, uh, would, uh, would come to pass about 90 years earlier. So we got the development without, without the park. And this is sort of not a crazy scheme, but a kind of a, um, kind of a lost dream, just remembering what stood here before all the plans started, uh, one of the last of the, of the great uh, giant trees that once uh, grew all along this shore in Ravenna Park, uh, which were mysteriously cut down a few decades later, I believe it was in the 1920s, uh, under suspicious circumstances. Uh, a parks commissioner that was lost. So as we consider the, uh, the Seattles that might have been, we might want to th think about uh, a bit of the Seattle that still was, almost within living memory. I don't know if anybody else is inspired by, by this range of ideas, but we passed out some, uh, some note cards here. And uh, if you have any, if you've got any pet projects, anything comes to mind, if it's uh, just a wild ass, you would not want to uh, state it in public. You can write it anonymously on the card and maybe we can collect them afterward and, uh, and consider some other possibilities. 
No? And as they say at the end of talks, any questions? Yes? Who was Ari Shaw? Ari? Oh, he was the city engineer. City engineer? Yes. Yes, and a, a true force of, I don't know, of nature, of a true force of some sort or other. Of course, he was also the, uh, um, also the, uh, led the, uh, uh, the effort to get the, uh, the high altitude water system, the, uh, the, res the reservoirs and dams that have proved to be so, um, uh, that, uh, that gave us, uh, gave the capacity for Seattle to grow to the kind of city it is today. Maria, Marie. Um, so Eric, that, you know, those are all, those are great stories and, you know, it's kind of like, it's great to see these things. Uh, you have a pretty loud voice, if you can hear me, no matter what, but, um, no, I'd be better without it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I can do fine with my own voice. Um, but no, we can't hear you back here. You can't hear me back no. there? So, it is working now. It's working now. Okay, so um, I was thinking that uh, from the flip side of this, if you might talk about a couple of ideas that did happen like crazy ideas that we did do that turned out well or bad. Hmm. Do you have any candidates? Yeah, you know, several. <laughs> well, I, I'm just thinking water, yeah, mm -hmm. um, was like way back, you know, after the fire, we, everybody here voted for, um, first of all, owning the public utilities, yes. which was really, and, you know, now think about that. Um, and then also, uh, you know, buying up water supply, thinking about a population mm -hmm. growth uh, that we achieved, but, but really a long time later. So it was really forward looking. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like an example of, one example of like when the voters did not do a stupid thing, they did a really smart thing, they, they looked way into the future. So I'm wondering if you have any other of those. Because it's kind of, I mean, it's depressing, you know, when we see all these great things that we didn't do. But we did do some pretty good things, too. Yeah, well, there and were. And stupid things. And we also didn't tear down the market and didn't, yeah. tear, and didn't tear down Pioneer Square, though we lost a bunch of, uh, of other great historic relics before, uh, before the preservation laws came in. Forward-looking in Seattle, uh, you know, there is the famous case of uh, Joe Desimone, who, uh, the, who was, uh, I forget the manager, anyway, kind of ran the Pike Place market and was the head of, a, of an a, a Italian farming family down in the, at the south end of the city, who, and in the 1930s, when the Boeing Company was looking at moving to Los Angeles, he provided the land down there along the Duwamish, uh, that they now occupy, where they could expand, uh, getting beyond the little, the little red barn on, on Lake Union, and so we still have the, uh, we still have Boeing, more or less. Uh, some other, <laughs> some other, uh, some other uh, forward-looking instances. You know, the formation of the Port of Seattle. And the development of the uh, de development of the commercial waterfront south of the town of the, of the commercial harbor uh, was also very ambitious. And even though the, you know the voters have, reje have rejected some big plans, uh, I mean Seattle is a city that's just I mean that thinks big, that has thought big from the beginning. You know the the, the famous name New York Alki, New York someday applied to a, a few uh, a few shacks on on Alki uh, by Alki Beach back in 1853. Uh, that was a uh, you know that was audacious, but um, it, it's been audacious again and again, and it's almost in the civic DNA, even in the business DNA, where the uh, you, you know you think of first Boeing and then Microsoft. Starbucks, Costco, Amazon, uh, the, uh, the uh, 
kind of uh, religion of getting big quick, growing fast, and just outgrowing, kind of, like, kind of like the big trees that outgrow the competition and shade them out. And that's, and that's been in the, uh, that's been in, um, that goes back to the beginning and that continues. Also forward thinking, well forward thrust, of course, in, uh, in 1968 because the voters did approve uh, a lot of parks around the city which we cherish now and you know, think have always been there. Uh, they approved community centers which are you know, really essential, uh, essential now. And uh, uh, farmland preservation uh, during the, in, uh, around, around the same time uh, the, you know, the 1% for Arts Fund and the public art as well as the arts education and kind of popular, popular neighborhood arts programs. I hope that's reassuring. <laughs> uh, yes, back, right back here. Well, I just thank you also to uh, Jim Ellis's uh, vision about cleaning up badly polluted Lake Washington. Mm -hmm. and forming Metro and- Thank you, uh, yeah, yeah. And another earlier example is another sort of big thinker that we brought out from New York would be the Olmsted brothers mm -hmm. and we did see significant implementation of their ideas. Yes, indeed, yeah, the, yeah, the two, the two really stellar examples. I think you had one right here. Yeah, do you, can you talk about the decision making um, and history of the straightening of the Duwamish? Can you talk about the history and the decision making regarding the straightening of the Duwamish River? I have not studied that process. And um, if you can tell us more, please do. Uh, but it was, I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers was, was certainly involved. And this was being done uh, at, uh, at ports, uh, uh, I mean, uh, on all the coasts and uh, up the Mississippi River and in the Great Lakes. Uh, the, the hardening of the shorelines and, and uh, not a lot of regard, of course, for the, for the, uh, for the living rivers. But uh, I don't know that there was, uh, I don't know that there was any, uh, that there was any loud opposition to it then. You know, the people who relied on the fish, well, as Joe talked about, the Duwamish, uh, Duwamish people who still lived along there, um, uh, didn't get a lot of ears. Mm hmm. Uh, he, yep, you know, uh, nature gets in the way. We knock it down or dig it out. Uh, yes, back, back here. Are you familiar with any of the, um, what could have been alternate plans for placing I 5 through central Seattle? Were there any other feasible ideas about where else it could have been placed? Uh, there was um, there was talk uh, in, in the as uh, people were you know were getting uh, uh, realizing the uh, dangers of uh, of urban freeways the effects of urban freeways of looping it around Lake Washington and uh, but uh, that didn't happen and it cut right through the neighborhoods as you know. Uh, the, uh, I, I just uh, on I-5, just in thinking of you know, one missed opportunity, it's really sad, is that the City Transportation Commission uh, uh, um, you know, recommend, uh, urged uh, reserving rail right-of-way along, along I-5 as they were building it, and uh, uh, the State Transportation Commission was, was not interested at all in that. They, uh, their job was, was and is to build highways. And so for, I forget, you know, what it was, $20 million or something like that, uh, a pittance by today's standards, we could have had that. We could have had that rail right of way and, uh, and a much cheaper and probably sooner uh, rail system. Yes. So as you were talking about with I-5 possibly going around Lake Washington, I was wondering, in your experience, what role did the suburban cities play in impacting how decisions here in Seattle were made? Were they ever used as a counterpoint to forcing voters to choose one thing or another? Well, at that time, a lot of the suburban cities weren't cities. I mean, weren't, weren't incorporated. Uh, and um, they were not so organized, and we didn't have the kind of structures of regional government, uh, metro, of course. and. Uh, 
and uh, so I don't believe they, uh, I don't believe they had a lot of influence. It was, it was, as I understand, and I, I, I could be corrected, but uh, it was really a matter of Seattle and the state and the state government. Yes. Mm -hmm. I thought I recalled that there was a ballot measure and people voted against that. I believe there was. <laughs> but it still yeah. happened. And it still happened. Was it just an advisory vote? Uh, yeah. Uh, but that again, that's a state highway. And so the funding was not coming from the city. Yeah. You had, you had one back here. same period as the waterfront you already mentioned was being created, but a bit before, some of the city fathers decided to build a railroad. And there were naysayers and the people that did it. Uh, it was called the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern. And it was going from Seattle north to Canada because Tacoma was trying to be the railroad terminus and they weren't going to let anything mm -hmm. like that happen. And so now we have a trail in that right away. And I'm sure you know a lot more about the railroad and that, and that they went east to get money from financiers in New York. Mm -hmm. They were really, really go-getters. So I'd love to hear whatever you could add to that. Well, the, that's another case where the city really did rally to the cause because it felt threatened by Tacoma, which got, the, uh, got a, um, a trans... <laughs> you know, this... Yeah, uh, gravity strikes. <laughs> the, uh, anyway, rallied to the cause, and of course, of, of uh, building a trans, uh, trans Cascades radio, uh, uh, Railroad, and that was, again, a, a case of unified forward thinking, and, uh, uh, it, uh, and it enabled Seattle, which had other advantages, to, uh, to overtake Tacoma and become the become the main city. I think we have one of the best inner city park systems that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a legacy that's really positive and really important. Yeah, the, yeah, the Olmstead plan wasn't quite completed. Uh, there, there, there were, you know, other connecting, uh, uh, connecting green boulevards that would have made it really a, really a complete network. But uh, a lot of it was, and uh, we can appreciate it now. Where, you know, the hole in the system, of course, is downtown, and uh, Westlake and, and the Commons were the, were maybe the two last chances. Although, as we saw here, we should never say it's a last chance, but. The two most recent opportunities to try and get that green back in the uh, in the center of the city. But uh, about that. Um, in terms of the the Ford Trust project to purify the waters, I lived in Seattle at that time, and I can remember human feces floating up on, on the shores of Lake Washington and the like. And so there's actual real need to do that. Um, some of these projects, like the Vogue Plan. Uh, it didn't they were they were more kind of like dreams or uh, mm -hmm. can you say that that uh, there's a relationship between the the actual real need for say traffic reform or or uh, creating new living spaces or something like that versus uh, versus uh, like some some architect or designer's dream uh, in terms of the success of the plan so we have forward thrust succeeded and we we, we purified our water, but the boat plan was failure. I think it was twice voted down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, 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 I mean, there was no real need for it, or was there? Well, the uh, elements of the Bogue plan, uh, the, uh, the transit system, I think many people did see as a need if Seattle was going to grow into the city that it would be. Uh, I mean, the, uh, but it was not a clear and present emergency. Uh, remember, by the way, I mean, Metro, uh, metro uh, had two parts. One, one of course, was uh, moving the sewage dumping from, uh, from Lake Washington to Puget Sound, where it created uh, other problems, creates other problems, but um, uh, was, uh, was better dispersed, and, uh, and integrated regional bus system. 
at that time you had Seattle Transit and you had, uh, you, you, and, and very little beyond the city. And uh, that, um, and that really tied the, uh, uh, really tied the region together. And uh, looking back was, um, yeah, was, uh, <laughs> you would hate to think what it would be, uh, uh, what the, uh, what getting around would be uh, like without that. Yes. Hey, uh, given the balance between nostalgia and wanting to move forward, can you handicap the current uh, uh, upzoning and density efforts for us and, and uh, tell us what you think is going to happen there? Handicap their prospects or? Yeah. You know, I think that the the combination, the, uh, well, I have a uh, friend named Sam Larkham, also deceased, but used to say, there's one rule, the developers always win. Uh, that wasn't the case in Pike Place Market. But uh, I would have to think that, yeah, that, sure, there will, there will be more upzoning and, and more concentration, and there will be battles over, uh, over particular aspects of it, but you, you, you've got the alliance of, uh, of development interests and urbanists and uh, housing advocates trying to, get, uh, trying to get a share of that for low income, and you've got all the, uh, all the employment pressures so far, unless Jeff Bezos decides to d ditch Seattle along with New York. So uh, I think we'll be seeing quite a bit of change. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, what's not going to happen is I-5 is like not going to get wider, you know, or mm -hmm. be re-engineered for more traffic. So that, you know, that being the case, then it has to be some other kind of transit option. And then the, what my question on it is like, I know that one urban idea now is, you know, taxing driving into the central city. Mm -hmm. that, um, money is something I know of, um, but I've listened to several discussions on on that way of changing, you know, the central city to be a more livable city mm -hmm. with less cars. But then, again, with less cars, we need more density. So business is too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and uh, the you can, raising parking uh, fee rates enough. Is kind of a, uh, is a is a is an indirect way of getting some of that uh, some of that effect. Yeah, that's uh, that's wildly unpopular at first. Uh, how did that? Uh, Singapore also, I believe, did that. And, and I think a number of cities in the, at least the you know the, the show I was listening to uh, talked about how it starts out widely unpopular and then. Oh, uh, the idea that taxi driving into the center city. Okay. Uh, taxi driving into the center city, that you pay a tax to go uh, you know, from the outskirts to downtown. Uh, and London, I know, has a, has a program like that. You mentioned Singapore. Uh, but that's like kind of a discussion at the level of urban planning now, so that uh, then that becomes a tax for more mass transit. Uh, yeah. Um, that's uh, Seattle's, Seattle's uh, topography would lend itself to that because you've got a limited number of, uh, of, main, uh, of main arteries coming into the central city and uh, uh, might make it easier to, uh, easier to, uh, to regulate. Not a lot of sound, not a lot of sound. Yeah, so you can see, mm -hmm. you know, from North Gate.
Oh, I was going to say, before, before any more questions, uh, does anybody else have index cards that uh, they'd like to send up? Uh, and the, um, any ideas? There are no bad ideas in this, uh, in this game. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Marie, you had another question. Um, well, I was just, I, I, well, I couldn't resist wanting to answer a couple of those questions out there, like, like about the density of housing, and and then uh, and make a shameless plug for History Link because uh, that's my organization, History Link, the online encyclopedia of Washington State history, and many of the questions you guys are asking, Eric, if you want to go on History Link you will find the history of that, and we are currently writing the history of the um, uh, transportation system in Seattle and the Puget Sound area, starting with um, the public transportation, starting with streetcars and moving, actually beginning with bikes, really, um, and then moving all the way through ST1, ST2, ST3 to where we are today, so you can understand that history better when that book comes out, and also, the Olmsted Parks, uh, we're writing the history of the Olmsted brothers uh, designed our park system here in the city of Seattle. If you don't know about it, it's pretty cool, and we're writing a book on that. So, um, shameless plug for History Link. And then, you know, like the question on housing, or many of the questions I've heard, you will, if you start reading this, you'll start to see patterns in our history. And as Eric pointed out, you know, there's kind of a DNA, and we follow that pattern over and over again. And the question about do we, do we react only to emergencies, the answer is no. This place is like a dreaming place, as you pointed out. Sometimes we dream, sometimes we don't. Um, so y y it isn't always in a response to an, an emergency. For example, there are really no reasons why we had to knock down all of the hills where we're sitting right now. We just did. Uh, why did we connect um, uh, Puget Sound, um, Lake Union, and Lake Washington, really? Mm, you know, kind of because we could. Um, <laughs> it's, this is one of the most uh, built uh, land masses anywhere. We just, for some reason, love to change the shape of where we live. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's also something that we continually do. And in terms of housing, we've seen this over and over again. And one thing I can tell you for sure there will come a time, and it won't be too far in the future, because I, because we just repeat this over and over, where we're going to have way too much housing. So, that's it. Uh, and that's happened before. And of course, uh, boom and bust cycles are also uh, uh, are also part of Seattle's DNA. Uh, uh, overshoot and uh, crash, and uh, and then recover uh, as as happened in uh, the 1890s before the Alaska Yukon boom and of course happened in the Boeing bust which was the uh, uh, the context for uh, for rejecting uh, forward thrust too. Oh, I have a question. Please. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I actually wrote it on one of those cards up there too. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the pro project that's going on now, the bio viaduct removal and the new waterfront Re reconnection to, of the city to the waterfront. And that's a vision that I've had all my life, so I'm really glad to see that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, We've, uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to that for a long time. Uh, I'm, of, I'm of two minds. I mean, I used to work in an office uh, where if its, if its window had opened, uh, I could have shot spitballs at the cars coming off the uh, Seneca Street. Uh, exit from the viaduct, and uh, uh, once walking under the viaduct, I got nearly hit by a uh, by a two foot piece of pipe that uh, flew off and landed right in front of me. Uh, 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 an eight foot section of that overpass just collapsed one day, uh, and um, uh, you know it was particularly vulnerable. But an elevated highway in the middle of an area like that is. Uh, it's a hard neighbor to live with. What will that be like? I, you know, there, you know, there are particular points about the shoreline, you know, shoreline access and what we we might have gotten there that you can quibble with. But the uh, 
but certainly the new seawall, the fish-friendly seawall, is pretty, is pretty splendid. Uh, I don't really know how thick it's, uh, people worry about how dense the surface traffic is going to be there without any access from, uh, from downtown to, uh, to 99. But uh, I'm, I'm just, I just can't guess because beha behavior has been kind of a little unpredictable. I mean, the, uh, you know, the traffic Armageddon that was supposed to happen in the gap between, uh, between shutting the viaduct and opening the tunnel didn't really happen. Uh, uh, the tunnel seems to be moving pretty smoothly uh, so far. Of course, I miss the views from the viaduct like everybody else. Well, let's see. Uh, a few ideas here. Uh, one, restoring the Colosseum Theater. <laughs> that doesn't sound so wild and crazy. Uh, tunnels to and from everywhere. <laughs> Any place in particular uh, you would want? Uh, I see. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we could get a little rapid rail down to uh, down to Oregon before that, uh, and 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 fewer planes. Uh, what role, effect, if any, did Jim Crow-esque zoning laws, laws have on Seattle? Uh, the, uh, historical question, but well, uh, it wasn't really uh, it wasn't really zoning laws. It was neighborhood covenants. And uh, that excluded uh, African Americans, uh, Jewish people, and uh, and Asians, and uh, from uh, from various uh, uh, from various districts in the city, in the city and outside. And it was uh, bank lending policy, redlining, that concentrated that concentrated them. Uh, the uh, but uh, you know I know I know that this became a big issue, and I kind of I weighed weighed in on it pretty. Uh, pretty loudly uh, when the uh, when the Halla uh, proposals were developed and um, uh, yeah, if you look at the history though uh, single va single family zoning uh, arrived kind of concurrently well zoning arrived concurrently with these uh, with these measures to to restrict minorities from neighborhoods but uh, that was concurrence not causation oh. KCPS, the public, radio, uh, public TV had a little blurb last night that part of the redlining came from New Deal policies as they tried to stabilize the banks mm -hmm. and that those lines uh, were drawn, you know, with the help of the federal government to show, like, income level, again, neighborhoods that had covenants that that didn't allow people of color or neighborhoods where they were concentrated, that those were like shaded as riskier loans. Mm -hmm. So the federal government kind of helped, you know, strengthen those lines. Uh, and then, you know, banking practices followed that. Well, that's all the wild ass ideas uh, we got. So, uh, unless anybody has any more to contribute or any other questions. Yes. I was thinking recently about visiting places where they have a complete underground, like shopping experience under their downtown high rises. So, mm -hmm. I think it was Toronto. Montreal has yes. that. Montreal has that. Yes, and, and I wondered why didn't we do that with all the rain and everything? You never have to come up to the surface. Well, you know, uh, Seattle, Seattle, Seattle rain is a lot milder than uh, than Montreal or Minnesota snow uh, uh, winter, uh, and um, yeah, like sky bridges. I mean, that's kind of. That can be somewhat uh, controversial because you know they say it removes people from the from the mix and f flow of the street, the full public space, and uh, it's, uh, and those uh, uh, you know those private spaces. Though we do have more, we do have more than that, um, you know, than you would think uh, on um, uh, at Rainier 
you know, at the, whatever it's called, the Rainier Tower and Fifth Avenue, there is one, there is a, a tunnel running under there, which I believe is being, uh, is being re uh, renovated now. Uh, we used to have a lot more underground, and here, I'll put, it, put in a shameless plug, because one of these months, the uh, Times is going to uh, publish my, my next uh, uh, feature for the magazine on uh, all the other underground Seattles, or what lies beneath the surface here. Uh, including uh, at, uh, at Pioneer Square, right under the, the square itself, the cross, Yesler and, uh, and First Avenue, and at Westlake, uh, opulent underground comfort stations, restrooms complete with shoe shines, marble, uh, marble stalls, and everything else. But, but uh, yeah, that movie, that, uh, that, that, and of course we, we did have the uh, the post uh, uh, the post uh, uh, I guess you could say the regrading the elevating of the streets in the Pi in the Pioneer Square area and the underground that's left uh, that's left there. But uh, of course, you also had you also had uh, you know supposedly sewage. I don't know if it's a Bill Spidell tale or not, but the sewage uh, uh, shooting up there. Uh, it really wasn't, uh, didn't lend itself to, uh, to building fancy underground shopping malls. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And <laughs> as I say, keep watching.